So Machen has been addressing the issue of public education and we've seen him make an effort to try to suppress the evils at work in public education, particularly in the interest of uh, having young people trained to be good Americans and using the American experience as the foundation for a moral code. Um, and Machen's objection is that when you try to build morals on the basis of human experience, it's, um, it's not solid ground. It, it cannot support a, a moral life. Uh, you know, what do you do when the, the morality of the American people is immoral? As, for example, when abortion is legal and homosexual marriage is legal and all these kinds of things. Uh, when, when slavery was legal years, many years ago, you know, what do you do about all these things? Um, you obviously can go to Germany and see the evils uh, that were legal there, uh, but uh, were certainly immoral. And all across the world, you can uh, multiply examples of that. So to build uh, a moral code based on what a good American is, you know, there's base it on human experience of whatever sort it is, uh, is uh, faulty and uh, leads to relativism and really the loss of morals altogether. So um, Machen gave his uh, recommendations for the, the state of public education in his day. You remember he described it as a necessary evil, um, something that's going to be with us but let's do what we can to kind of restrain that evil. And he had a, a variety of proposals to that end, um, uh, a couple of which were a little bit surprising, perhaps. Uh, he did not want Bible reading in the public schools uh, because that could be twisted. Um, and Machen could see that just in the Presbyterian churches of his day, where right there in the church, the Bible was twisted by liberal theologians and liberal pastors to say what it really doesn't say. And so uh, it does no good to have the Bible read in the public schools if the teachers themselves are um, acting in such a way to undermine, undermine the, the true message of Scripture. And what is more, you cannot just simply collect different verses of Scripture that are in common with other religious faiths like Judaism, Islam, or what have you, and gather these things together and say, well, this is a lesson for today. And so he read a lot from the Psalms because that appeals to the Jews and um, Christians have that in common. And perhaps the uh, Islamists might be interested in the Old Covenant law to a certain extent. So you, you can find your readings from select portions and, and other nomisms in the New Testament that would generally find agreement in other religions. But you miss the real heart of Bible reading, which is the gospel of Christ, the way of redemption and salvation in Him. So the whole thing gets messed up and, and fed into the uh, program of works righteousness, of reforming your life uh, by living a good life and so forth. So. Machen was not in favor of Bible reading in the public schools and a wide variety of other things. Um, he sought to uh, keep education at the local level, try to keep parents involved in it, and hopefully that would restrain the, the um, collective force of the world spirit in our age uh, as it manifests itself in big government and so forth. So, um, one of the things that Machen, uh, to, to wrap up uh, here, is that uh, Machen criticized this idea of the moral perfectibility of human nature. Uh, the idea that by um, moral guidance you can improve your life, what have you, and it, it comes in, in the mainline Protestant churches in the terms of a Christ life. Um, so we can follow the example of Christ, learn from his teachings, and, and live for ourselves the Christ life in which we are continually improving uh, as individuals. And Machen says that this too is uh, worthless and, and destructive because um, 
you cannot appreciate the redeeming work of Christ unless you first of all have an appreciation for our personal sin. And our personal sin makes it so that we cannot live a Christ life, um, uh, constantly perfecting ourselves and so forth. Uh, we have a moral nature that is uh, corrupted, given over to sin, enslaved to sin, and incapable of doing that which is right and good in God's sight. So uh, he talks here at the end of our study last time about um, the importance of the law of God informing us, convicting us of our sins, and showing us our need for Christ. And so uh, we'll pick up our reading here as uh, Machen goes on, and he has a number of suggestions or a number of uh, proposals that people are making that he wants to respond to and give his own thoughts on how to improve things. He writes, It is not surprising, therefore, that other ways of approach are often proposed. This way being rough and thorny, that is the way of conviction for sin, repentance, uh, pleading with God for mercy, that's a rough and thorny path. Um, so other ways are being sought. It seems hard to many men to enter into the Christian life through the little wicked gate. And many, therefore, are clam, clambering up over the wall. Um, Machen may be gathering some imagery from a couple of different places there, from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Enter through the narrow gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life, and so forth. And then you have uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where uh, Pilgrim uh, comes to the wicked gate. And remember, he has this big sack on his back, and he can't get through the gate with that sack. It's the uh, kind of a symbol of his sin that weighs him down. And it's not until he releases himself of that sin as he uh, uh, gets rid of it that he's able to enter into the narrow gate. So there needs to be a repentance for sin in order to enter into life. Then clambering over the wall it reminds me of uh, John chapter 10 and Jesus talking about the good shepherd and he's the door, the gate through which we go in and out and find pasture. But others climb over the wall. There are thieves, Jesus says, speaking of the false teachers, the Pharisees and so forth who lead many astray and seek to destroy. So uh, Machen um, says here are some of the ways in which people think that uh, we can change things. And he writes, first, in the first place, there is the purely intellectual way. The claims of Christianity, it is said, must be investigated on their merits by the use of a rigidly scientific method. And only if they are established as true may they be allowed to control the emotional and volitional life. So here's the suggestion that we need to examine Christianity intellectually or rationally. Um, and this is a, a, an approach that has been destructive and harmful to the church for many years, centuries now. Uh, in particular, during the time of the Enlightenment, rationalism came to the fore. Uh, people wanted to examine the claims of Christianity on the basis of human reasoning. And uh, so claims about the creation of the heavens and the earth in six days, uh, a recent creation, uh, come into evaluation. Um, the resurrection of Christ gets uh, questioned, the miracles, the inspiration, authority of Scripture, all these things become subject to the acid test of human reasoning. And this method then is used uh, uncritically by many today, and in Mason's day, uncritically uh, to dismiss the teachings of Scripture uh, without understanding uh, the, the presuppositions that are at work for this intellectual way. Um, so Machen says, For this method of approach, as will be clear from all that has been said in the preceding exposition, we have the warmest sympathy. Indeed, we believe there is nothing wrong with the method itself so far as it goes. But the trouble lies in the application of the method. 
If a man were truly scientific, we think, he would be convinced of the truth of Christianity whether he were a saint or a demon. Since the truth of Christianity does not depend at all upon the state of the soul of the investigator, but is objectively fixed. But the question is whether a method which ignores the consciousness of sin is really scientific or not. And the answer must be, we think, that it is not. If you take account of all the facts, you will be convinced of the truth of Christianity. But you cannot take account of all the facts if you ignore the fact of sin. You cannot take account of all the facts if, while searching the heavens above and the earth beneath, you neglect the facts of your own soul. So here Machen is bringing to our attention the fact that sin uh, affects us not only um, in terms of our, our emotions, our will, and these kinds of things, but also our intellect. It distorts our minds so that we cannot see and understand things appropriately. And so if you, you try to decipher the truthfulness of Scripture and the truth claims of Scripture, making use of a method which objectively on its own is fairly good, but in the hands of one who is corrupted, then you're going to get a false conclusion every time. Um, if I were to try to read this text with my sunglasses on, I might have a difficult time reading what's there because the sunglasses bring a shade over to what's going on. Or conversely, if I try to read with my glasses off, uh, I'm also going to have trouble there too. The problem is with me internally, existentially, in the way that I see things. Uh, no, nothing wrong with the computer uh, and the, the script that's on the screen. That's objectively valid. But without my glasses on, I can't quite distinguish everything that's there and I'm going to make mistakes. I'll misread things. I need glasses. I need the redeeming work of Christ. I need the illuminating work of the Spirit to enable me to see and understand things. So, um, Machen argues that a truly scientific method takes into account all the facts, including the fact of human sin and the impact of that sin on the human intellect. And that changes the equation entirely. Uh, now, you're coming to a situation where the science, scientist is inwardly hostile to the truth claims of Christianity and motivated to dismiss them. Because if he accepts those truth claims, then he's guilty before God. He faces the wrath of God for an eternity. And he must humble himself before Jesus Christ, acknowledging his miracles, acknowledging the truth of his word and his resurrection and so forth, and uh, pleading with him for forgiveness and a new life. This is the, uh, uh, the rough and thorny path that the, the, the wicked do not wish to pursue. So... Uh, the problem with a scientific method that excludes a, a major portion of reality, which is the, uh, the scientist himself, the observer himself, and what he brings to the table, um, that uh, really is not truly a scientific uh, approach. I was reading some time ago a fellow who uh, has analyzed uh, uh, science and, and scientific uh, reports the kinds of things you see in journals today and has found that um, over at a, about 50 percent of all uh, scientific papers are not duplicable you cannot repeat uh, what they discovered they, they amass this information they put it together into a report and they come to their conclusions but if somebody else comes alongside and tries to repeat their process they don't come to the same conclusion it turns out that there were a lot of things that were a little messed up in uh, the scientific journal report. The scientists had an axe to grind. The scientist was blinded to certain facts. Um, he rejected certain things outright. And so um, science is not the objective arbiter of truth as one would, uh, as scientists would want to uh, suggest. And that's especially true in our political day when you have people saying to uh, follow the science, you know, and, and they tell you to wear a mask and these sorts of things and get a vaccine shot and all that and 
They're not entirely following the science, particularly with regard to natural immunity. They pay no attention to that. Uh, clearly, there's a financial motive involved here. Uh, these pharmaceutical companies are raking in millions of tax dollars, and uh, probably their paybacks to the politicians and the political party to support them in their campaign because it's the Democrats who are funneling this money into the pharmaceutical companies and so forth. So um, follow the science. Maybe you should follow the money first. <laughs> but um, Anyway, so Machen highlights the effect of sin on the mind in order to understand uh, how it's able to take a look at the facts, the objective facts of Christianity. Continuing, let us see how the ostensibly scientific approach to Christianity works out. In pursuance of it, we begin in a systematic way. We bring forward first our arguments for the existence of a personal God. And I, for my part, believe that they are rather good arguments. They have not altogether been demolished, I think, by the criticism of Kant. Um, these are arguments from design, uh, teleological arguments, uh, arguments from cause, uh, and, and different kinds of things like this. Um, if then we have established the existence of God, the question arises whether he has revealed himself in such fashion as that personal communion with him becomes possible for mankind. Probably it will be admitted that if he has done so at all, he has done so in the Christian religion. Christianity will probably be admitted to offer the most plausible claim, at least, among all the religions of the world, to be based upon a real revelation of God. But as even the Christian claim accredited itself, it has done so to put the matter in briefest compass and deal with it at the really crucial point if Jesus rose from the dead. It has not done so if he did not rise. Now there is certainly some evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Admittedly, his intimate friends believed that he had risen, and upon that belief the church was founded. But what in turn caused that belief? Many answers have been proposed to this question, but none of them is thoroughly satisfactory except the simple answer that the belief of the disciples was founded upon fact. So much will be rather widely admitted. The origin of the Christian church is admittedly a very puzzling fact. Only ignorance can deny the difficulty of the historical problem that it involves for all naturalistic historians. So naturalistic historian is the one who looks at the world in such a way that he dismisses the supernatural, finds no place for that, and tries to interpret everything in terms of cause and effect relationships in a materialistic world. That's a naturalistic worldview. Um, and so when you come to the evaluation of Christianity, and in particular, the evaluation of the resurrection of Christ on which Christianity is founded, then when you approach that resurrection from the standpoint of naturalism, you, you, you've got a real problem because uh, the evidence is rather stark, rather clear for a resurrection from the dead. But the naturalist, of course, is not going to be content with that, and they will do what they can to suppress that and explain it away. So, uh, Machen continues, But a difficulty, it will be said, is also found in the traditional solution as well as in the naturalistic solutions. The difficulty appears in the supernatural character of the alleged event. If the resurrection were an ordinary event, the evidence for it would admittedly be sufficient. But then, as a matter of fact, it is not an ordinary event, but a miracle. And against the acceptance of any such thing, there is a, an enormous weight of presumption. So the scientific method depends on the ability to replace or to repeat something, get the same sort of event time and time again. And with this repetition, then you say, ah, you see, this is something that is natural. This is something that is regularly occurring. And so we can believe that. A supernatural event, a miracle, 
which goes against the laws of uh, nature and so forth, uh, that interrupts this naturalistic uh, worldview, and consequently the naturalist is blind to that. He, he, he rules it out and says, well, it can't by definition be true because it's not a repeatable event. It's a one-off. And maybe I can explain it as an irrational event, just a, a random accident or something like that, but it's not something on which I can base my life on. I have to base my life on repeatable events that I can verify and, and, and prove in a materialistic uh, manner. And so uh, the naturalist uh, uh, rejects the resurrection not merely because it's something that it has happened and testified, but it's also an evidence of a su supernatural act of God in history and time. And it's a kind of one-off. It's not something that regularly happens, and so therefore I cannot accept it. So that is the weight of presumption. A miracle is a once and done kind of thing. It happens occasionally, and it's not repeated. Uh, except, of course, in the case of Jesus, he did many, many miracles. Uh, there were many, many witnesses to his miracles. Uh, the Apostle John concludes the Gospel by saying that uh, he didn't include all the, that Jesus said and done. If he did, it, you know, all the world could not have contained all the books regarding that. Um, so uh, the naturalist uh, is actually having a problem there. Uh, but if Jesus did it and, and people will testify to that, who else can do it? And that's what they want to see. So continuing, this objection... I, for my part, am not at all inclined to take lightly. Indeed, if the evidence for the resurrection, as we have outlined it, stood alone, it might, I think, be insufficient. Even if a dozen men for whose character and attainments I had the highest respect were to come into the room and tell me, quite independently, that they had seen a man rise from the dead, I am not sure whether I should believe them for a moment. Why then do I accord to witnesses of so long ago, witnesses too who lived in a comparatively unscientific age, though its unscientific character is often enormously exaggerated, a degree of credence which I might refuse to trained observers of the present day? Why do I believe in the resurrection of Jesus when I might not believe, even on the basis of overwhelming testimony, in the resurrection of one of my contemporaries. So Machen faces head on the uh, problems of believing in the testimony of witnesses who are now 2,000 years old in an age and period of time which the modern age considers to be uh, superstitious, uh, believing in magic and, and you know, cre credulous to all kinds of things. Why should I believe these people testifying to something when if I were sitting here today with uh, respected people standing in front of me testifying to the fact that they have seen somebody rise from the dead, I would question that. You know, do you not do that today? When, when you hear Pentecostals talking about somebody being healed and stepping up out of their wheelchair and so forth and these kinds of things, do you attach immediate credibility to what they have to say? I don't. Uh, I, I, I question that, and uh, I would want to look into it further. In any case, um, Machen is going to face this issue squarely, uh, head on, and uh, we'll follow his reasoning for a little bit here. The question seems at first sight hard to answer, but the answer is really not so difficult as it seems. The answer is that I believe in the miracle which is at the foundation of the Christian church because in that case the question does not concern merely the resurrection of a person about whom I know nothing, a mere X or Y, but it concerns specifically the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus was like no person who has ever lived. It is unbelievable, I say, that any ordinary man should be raised from the dead. But then Jesus was no ordinary man. In his case, 
the enormous presumption against miracle is reversed. In his case, far from its being inconceivable that he should have been raised, it is inconceivable that he should not have been raised. Such an one as he could not possibly have been holden of death. Thus, the direct evidence for the resurrection is supplemented by an impression of the moral uniqueness of Jesus' person. Okay, let's look at that for a moment. Uh, <clears throat> we're not talking about just any person who was raised from the dead. It's like when you have the Pentecostal uh, miracles and name it, claim it stuff, and somebody gets up, some stranger gets up out of their wheelchair and says, Hallelujah, I've been healed, and so forth. And you don't know this person, uh, you don't know the relationship of the person to the, the uh, Pentecostal preacher, the charismatic preacher, uh, you don't know what's going on there, then certainly a measure of skepticism is warranted, it seems to me, uh, in, in terms of what's taking place here. Maybe there's some uh, secret agreement between the two to do this and to um, deceive people so that the uh, preacher can get a certain measure of wealth and, and notoriety and uh, and so forth, and perhaps share that with the person who claims to be healed. In any case, uh, the quality of the person in whom the miracle is performed comes into view. And when it's Jesus, then the testimony of Scripture about Jesus and the witness to him of all those who saw him is that this was no ordinary kind of person. Um, you could talk first about all the many miracles that he performed. Again, miracles observed by his followers, but also by his enemies, right there in front of the Pharisees and his chief priests and the Sadducees and so forth. He, he was in the synagogue teaching and he healed the man whose arm was withered, straightened out his arm. Another, the paralyzed man comes through the roof of the house and everybody's wondering, what's he going to do? It's a Sabbath day. Is he going to heal this man? And he rise up and walk. The man walks out and so right there in front of not only his friends and followers, but also his enemies, those who are hostile to him, he performs these miracles. So there's no question of the miracles being performed. And the multiplicity of miracles also uh, is not questioned. So the supernatural very clearly, obviously, attended Jesus and his ministry. But what is more, you have the authority of his teaching. How he goes back to the law of Moses and faithfully explains what the law of God says to the embarrassment of the religious leaders of the day who had misinterpreted that law. And so here Jesus is one who is arguing for the faithfulness of God's law, for truthfulness, and he's being truthful all along the way. And what is more, in the process of this teaching, he's showing that he is the one who fulfills the Old Covenant Scriptures. And he points to, ahead to the fact, predicts the fact, that he is going to be crucified and rise from the dead on the third day. So you have all these things factoring into the person of Jesus. Uh, you have his sinless life, the fact that no one could accuse him of any sin. They had to have false witnesses give false testimony in order to bring a charge against him. And in the sham trial that they had to uh, determine that he needed to be crucified. So here is one for whom the supernatural was clearly uh, uh, abundantly evident in his life. Uh, a, a reputation for following the truth, following the law of God, uh, even refuting the false teaching of the day. And uh, an example, a more example, that was exemplary and beyond reproach by anyone. That is the person of whom the claim is that he rose again from the dead. That makes much more sense. If you're following along a scientific method and saying, well, what's the evidence for that? What is it that leads into this resurrection? Well, certainly the, the, the presence of the supernatural, the uh, approval of God on his life, uh, his integrity, his righteousness, his truthfulness, all these things factor into this being an unusual person, and you cannot be surprised if he even rises from the dead. After all, he raised others from the dead himself too, Lazarus being one uh, right before his own crucifixion. So um, factoring the person into this brings us to a conclusion that, in fact, his resurrection is true. It's, if you will, scientifically valid because when you 
bring in the whole body of facts and factor them all in, then the conclusion is inescapable. It is only reasonable to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. And it is unreasonable to deny it. It's only mere uh, bias, hostility, uh, and really wickedness to reject the fact of the resurrection on which the Christian church is based. So Machen continues, that does not mean that if we are impressed by the moral uniqueness of Jesus' person, the direct evidence for the resurrection is unnecessary, or that the Christian can be indifferent to it, but it does mean that that impression must be added to the direct evidence in order to produce conviction. So Machen is not arguing that we just accept it fideistically, just by faith, just on the assertion that Jesus rose, we are free to investigate the evidence, free to look at the testimony of those who were eyewitnesses, free to examine even his enemies and their reactions to this, free to examine the impact of the resurrection on his followers and how they followed him and confessed him, confessed his resurrection even to the point of losing their own lives for the truthfulness of that confession. Um, when we examine these facts as well, um, then surely we can uh, find the resurrection to be more than credible. Machen continues, but how do we know that Jesus' moral character is absolutely unique? We do so only because of our conviction of sin. Convinced of our own impurity, as revealed by the majesty of the divine law, we become convinced of his dissimilarity in kind from us. And thus we say that he alone was pure. Thus even in order to establish the fact of the resurrection, the lesson of the law must be learned. So remember the broader topic of this chapter is faith and our moral need, our, uh, and the human need. Uh, we are sinners and we need the law of God to reveal our sin to us. Except we have that ministry of the law in our hearts, we cannot become convinced of sin. This is why uh, I think in, in our preaching and in our witnessing we need to talk to people about what God's law demands. And admittedly the society in general does not feel the same way as we do about things, but that doesn't mean we remain silent. We should talk about the evils of abortion, the evils of homosexuality, the evils of uh, 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 divorce for any reason, uh, the evils of living together and all these kinds of things. And so uh, the law of God is necessary to produce conviction within the heart. And when that conviction comes and we see our own sin, then by contrast we can see the unique purity of Jesus, how different he was from us. And uh, I think when you read the Gospels, you come away certainly with that impression. This was no ordinary person. This is someone who was without any hint of immorality or sin. So, but in order to see the righteousness of Christ, you need to see the righteousness of the law and your own sinfulness in that regard. So your sin becomes a kind of a backdoor testimony to the righteousness and purity of Christ. He is different from you. And your sin allows you to see that in him. Machen continues, in another way also the conviction of sin is necessary in order that we may believe in the resurrection of Christ and thus accept the claims of Christianity. The resurrection, as we have seen, if it really took place, was a miracle. It involved an intrusion of the creative power of God into the course of the world. So stupendous an event is difficult to accept unless we can detect for it an adequate purpose. And the adequate purpose is detected only by the man who is under conviction of sin. Such a man alone can understand the need of redemption. He alone knows that sin has introduced a great rent into the very structure of the universe, which only a creative act of God can close. 
The truly penitent man rejoices in the supernatural, for he knows that nothing natural can possibly meet his need. He rejoices even in the new consciousness of the uniformity and unity of nature, which has been so widely disseminated by modern science. For that uniformity of nature only reveals with new clearness the sheer uniqueness of the redemption offered by Christ. So, Machen wants the, the, the naturalistic scientist to understand that uh, he is a sinner before God, uh, that he has broken God's law, and he needs to repent and return to God in uh, confessing his sins and seeking forgiveness. And it's only in this way that he will be adequ adequately equipped to acknowledge the resurrection of Christ, to see the uniqueness of his divine person, how he is sinless through and through. And so uh, when the the naturalistic scientist denies the authority of God's law over him, denies that he is subject to that law, denies that he's a sinner in the way that God describes it, then he's not capable of appreciating the redemption of Christ, the, the work of redemption that Christ accomplished. He cannot understand why it is that Jesus rose from the dead. That is, he cannot understand how our sins have been atoned for at the cross and now Jesus is justified by God by his resurrection from the dead. He's validated in the sense, uh, vindicated in the sense that his righteousness is affirmed and he's risen from the dead. And so uh, he's fully satisfied the law of God for us. He has been our sin bearer. He took that sin away by his sufferings on the cross. And now there being no further sin for which he is accountable uh, as our substitute, he is then set free from the bonds of death and rises into the glory of God, uh, which is his. So, the, the uh, perception of uh, sin within is necessary in order to be able to properly view the resurrection of Christ. Um, let me just make uh, one more statement or so and then we'll finish up today. Thus, even in order to exhibit the truth of Christianity at the bar of reason, it is necessary to learn the lesson of the law. It is impossible to prove, first, that Christianity is true, and then proceed on the basis of its truth to become con conscious of one's sin. For the fact of sin is itself one of the chief foundations upon which the proof is based. Uh, that, that's a very significant point uh, that I think uh, any Vantillian would appreciate. <laughs> um, you, you cannot use human reasoning to come to a recognition of the truth of Christianity, first of all, before you then begin to accept uh, sin, our sin before God, and the redemption of Christ, and so forth. Human reasoning will never bring you to an acceptance of the truth of Christianity. You have to have that inner sense of our sin first uh, in order to appreciate uh, why Christianity is true and what it has accomplished. So, um, you know, this is kind of the kind of thing that addresses the uh, evidentialist in uh, apologetics, guys like John Warwick Montgomery and uh, others like him who argue from evidences to try to persuade people of the truth of Christianity uh, and, and see that man is morally neutral, able to evaluate the evidence for himself and come to his own conclusion. Um, that's not going to fly because the, the nature of man is sinful through and through and will reject the evidence however objectively valid it is. Uh, he, he is predisposed to be hostile to that objective evidence and will reject it. And so the evidentialist has a problem. Uh, he's speaking to the wind. He might as well speak to the wall. Uh, it's not going to respond unless God sovereignly, graciously changes the heart. And he needs to call the individual to repentance uh, in order to see the truth of Christianity. Um, so that affects the, the evangelical evidentialist, but it also affects the Roman Catholic who believes that uh, 
uh, with, with Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, that human reasoning can take us so far, and then after we get so far in evaluating things in the world, then the church steps in with its authority and tells us where to go from that point on, and we accept what the church says by faith. And so we enter into the realm, really, of the uh, mystical, the mythological, uh, the, 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 the mere uh, authority of the church uh, as uh, over us, and we are expected then to leave what reasoning ha has said to us thus far, uh, abandon it at this point, and take a leap of faith into what the church says and follow that. And that, too, clearly is not going to get us anywhere. If you follow along with Plato and Aristotle and the rest of the, the Greeks and the Romans and all the rest of them in their ph philosophical reasoning, you're not going to come to Christianity. You're not going to come to the point of saying, yes, I'm ready to listen to what the church has to say. <laughs> Why should I believe the church? Uh, there's nothing about my method at this point thus far that warrants the authority of the church to step in and, and say this is the way it is without evidence. You just accept it on my authority, on tradition, on our interpretation of Scripture. So the, the Roman Catholic also, I think, falls prey to this approach. And certainly the mainline Protestant who uh, is not interested at all really about Scripture, Revelation, the objective truth of Christianity, what counts for him is the subjective feelings, what you think about God, and you have your own experience in the course of life, and as long as you are true to yourself and finding your own experience emotionally valid for you, then you are fine, and uh, objectivity is completely lost. Okay, I think I'll finish there and turn it over for discussion, and we'll pick up our reading here for God willing next time. I think, yeah, there's still another next time here. I see August approaching in the calendar, and I don't want to remind Rick of that because he's tired from preaching from the other day. <laughs> <laughs> You're going back to work, pal. <laughs> no, no, I got put back in the harness. So That's right. I'm ready yeah. to go. Back in the harness. <laughs> back in the saddle again. All right. I, I think it's this is a great study. I, I think it's scary how far the mainline, this particularly the, the mainline Protestant church, has gotten off base. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, frightening. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's an, as Machen said in his book Christianity and Liberalism. It is a different religion. It's not Christianity. It has the name of being Christian, but it is not. It is hostile to true Christianity at every point. Um, so I, I, was, I was listening to Prager on the radio for a few minutes, for I don't know, maybe 10, 15 minutes yesterday, and he was going on to explain uh, a piece of USA church in Boston had on their sign, and God said, and then it had the entire, the entire radical agenda underneath. You shall have abortions. You shall do all these things, and wow. it's unbelievable. Um, I, I I couldn't even believe it. I, I I didn't go bother looking it up or anything. I was just yeah. I was just uh, yeah. Come to that, you know. Did he identify it as USA? Because I didn't hear him yesterday, but I've heard him a few days back calling it the Presbyterian Church, but he didn't say USA. And he, I he said, yeah, yeah, he yeah. clarified that. He said it was a Presbyterian church, Presbyterian USA. Good. Yeah, he, he, he clarified that. And uh, I was thinking, well, how, I mean, uh, they, they're so far, they're completely 100% wrong. I, I, you, you, they're, they've taken the entire leftist, every, everything you can think of that they've come up with, and put it on a billboard under God said. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that goes back, um, you know, going back to what, he's, what, what Major was talking about, education, that's that's a good example of how you can have the Bible in the schools, but the exactly. story, you know, and yeah. I, I always thought that this country started going downhill when they took the Bible out of the schools, but 
maybe it wasn't taking it out. Maybe it was because it was in and it was being distorted. You know? And it's a good or, way I thought of it like that. Yeah, it. or a combination thereof. Yeah, I mean, there yeah. was there were still some good Christian teachers who would teach the truth, but they got thrown out with a bathwater, you know. So, so it, it just supports the idea of just just come out from among them and and have your own school. Yeah, how they kind of make the, the, the any scripture conform to their whatever it is in their mind, you know, you know, like their their ideal, and, and but by putting it, taking everything out of context and building this theme that's not even like real. It, 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 that's a that's just as scary as throwing, the, you know, as, as not having the Bible in sports. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's uh, our, our local Percocet Mennonite church, I learned, was involved in the Percocet farmer's market. They were able to have a vendor's table because they were there during Pride Month to read children's stories that included inclusive language and uh, under the guise of being the church. So it's... You know, this, this is... Uh, Evil is just yeah. throughout throughout our country now. It's just subtle evil, or not so subtle evil, mm -hmm. <laughs> rather. Yeah, yeah m m misleading children with false Bible readings is something I wouldn't want to pay the. Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a serious. You know, um, you know, we conservatives, you know, political conservatives on the whole, will say, "Well, what's the, the way to correct the problem in the public schools?" Well, you got to stop all the indoctrination going on in the public schools, and get back to their original mandate: teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and things like that. Well, the problem is, if you confine yourself to those kinds of topics, the the moral philosophy, the, the world view, still occupies those, those topics. I mean, mathematics, they're looking on as uh, uh, racist, uh, supporting a white supremacist system. Logic and reasoning is something that is uh, um, something that feeds into the dominance of the white culture. And so that other ways of knowing in, in minority communities are not being respected. <laughs> so, you know, here's mathematics, the, the most analytical of, of most, you know, of the sciences, you know, pure science, if you will. Um, pure reasoning, it's from the viewpoint of the woke, um, hopelessly uh, corrupted. And they'll teach from that perspective. And you, you know, it, it, more obvious example is the teaching of history. Well, we'll teach history, we'll teach American history, but we're going to teach it from our perspective, and everything that's right is wrong, and everything that's wrong was right, you know. And we're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater and uh, teach children to hate their country. So, um, it, it, the answer, is, as Machen was pointing out, is, is really uh, Christian schools, home schools, anything like that, where you can uh, um, te raise up a child in the way that he should go, so that when he's old he will not depart from it. Teach him in the fear and admonition of the Lord. Um, so you got to take into account the worldview of the person who's doing the teaching or writing the math books, the, the science books, the history books and all that sort of thing. I mean, the science obviously is just polluted and corrupted by uh, a naturalistic viewpoint. And um, so you know, every step along the way, it's corrupted, it's polluted. So <laughs> just to take out the sex education, you know, and, and re return to reading and math and so forth and uh, language. You know, this is this is God's world. This is the human being's world. Yeah. So everything has to start with God and His revelation to us. If it doesn't, then the education is going to be offline. Oh, uh, you know, and all. Um, yeah. This is why I believe that America went wrong when it abandoned private education back in the 1800s. Yep. and allowed the socialistic uh, liberalization of, of government schools to come in. That's when we, so it's it's not, you know, uh, you know, a fairly within our contemporary age, 
phenomenon going on. It goes back a couple generations further than that. And all the Horace Man and Dewey and those those men. You know, with the, the contemporary stuff, the left, the left doesn't even realize how racist they are, because they're saying that people of color are not capable of understanding the advanced math and the order of math that is the result of a creator who is the God of order, and he, we wouldn't have math without the order that was created by God, yeah. and they say that that. People of color are not capable of understanding that. Mm -hmm. they, they don't see their inherent racism. Yeah. There are there are God given truths that don't change. Two plus two will always equal four. If a Democrat wants to tell me an egg equals five, then then that person needs to be locked up. They're crazy. Uh, uh, evidently, many, many they're not they're not they're not yeah. living consistently yeah. with what the world was, which was created by God. You know, a, a, a woman is not a man. A man is not a woman. You can't let that be. You know, and to, to say that it can, and I've been seeing things on Facebook now where men are saying, oh, I can have a baby. <laughs> Duh. Yeah, you know, uh, you know. So a duck can have a cow. Sure. Yeah, yeah. And a, and a cow can have a pig. Sure. You know, what's what are the? How can people think that way? We have to show them the fallacy of their thinking and how it's it's craziness. It's not. It's it's not thinking God's thoughts. Because that's the thought that we need to have. We have to think God's thoughts after Him. Well, they're under a delusion. I don't know if they can understand it unless God makes them understand. Right. I think, you know, even we talk about witnessing to people and knowing that the Holy Spirit has to change the heart. I think we see the same thing on a lot of truths, uh, historical truths. Um, mathematical tr truths, whatever, you know, uh, because of this wokeism and because of the the liberal mindset that has come into our education system and politically now and so forth, people are, you know, uh, they are they are blind, not just to the truth about God and their sin, but they're they're blind to many other things that we take for granted that because we we learned them as children yeah you know that two and two equals four and that uh, uh boys don't have babies girls have babies and so on Shocking. it's bizarre it's like on a star trek show or something where you were like beamed into a bizarre world where everything's backwards <laughs> And it's like, yeah. it's just like a, you know, that would make perfect sense on a Star Trek episode, you know, and, <laughs> and, but it's like you're in there and you, you're trying to find your way back out because it's making you crazy. But it's, 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 it's so bizarre that you can't, I mean, I don't even know if a good science fiction writer can come up with this. <laughs> it, it, it would take an immoral, mentally unbalanced person to, to come up with this nonsense and be so forceful at putting it out there. And, and you have to wonder why, how, how can so many people take it seriously? How come when they come up and say, well, we're going to have this agenda in school of, of critical race theory? Well, you're not. It's stupid. Get out of here. You know, if you, if you grift it out again, we're going to have the authorities come and get you, take you away. You're crazy. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> the whole yeah. thing's so bizarre that they're actually able to, to have, pursue it and actually have it and state it into a school, like into the curriculums. How is that even possible? It's like nightmare you can't get out of us <laughs> and we're financing it with our tax <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this is the university of penn that nominated leah thomas to be the woman of the year for was it time magazine or something like that <laughs> <laughs> looney tunes these people need to be locked up i mean 
Imagine if 50 years ago, right, if, if any, oh, any yeah. of this sh showed up anywhere, on, uh, anywhere, in any school or anything, the reaction people would have to it. They, they would be pushed right back out to the insane asylum where they belong. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, I mean, it's so surely immorality. Completely twisted. You know, immorality kind of took over. And, yeah. yeah. Well, back then we had judges... See, the, I think a lot of these people are afraid of being sued or having it tied up in litigation. Yeah. But at least then maybe we had judges that would have thrown it out as being a frivolous lawsuit. Yeah. But but hey, they're afraid. Right. Of being, yeah. <laughs> so they say, okay, well, you know, rather than go through litigation, let's just, okay, you want to be a man, fine, whatever. So th that's that's a big part of it. I mean, the, even the... If the lawyers, the judges, they're all coming out of leftist colleges. Mm -hmm. so And justice departments. Yeah. 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 So they have the whole thing that if you, if you in any way, show them how crazy they are or point it out to anybody, they're coming after you with everything they have. And, you know, and yeah. it is, you know, it's a bad spot. This is, this is what it comes out to be. This is what it grows into. Yeah, and supported by the media. Yeah, <laughs> the, the media is so insane. The, the, not 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 all media, but the, the, certainly the the, the uh, radical, you know, uh, uh, media is, is so so crazy. They they are outright just simply lying about this, and and don't even care if it. They're not even trying to cover it or use any kind of. You know, what way to make it like seem more real? They don't even care. It's just bizarre, and they just put it out there. <laughs> I was going to include this in our uh, study this morning. I forgot to do it, but in, in, in Ephesians four, Paul writes, uh, "I testify." Excuse me. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But this is not the way you learn to Christ. Um, Paul just takes them apart and shows the, the corruption and darkness and blindness of the human heart. and um, it, It's accurate. That's a great, that's very accurate. Yeah. It's a good one. You see it in the news every day. Just the yeah. weird things people are coming up with. So, Pastor, uh, I'm going to have to, I admit that I'm, I'm going to have to read this chapter again. But I, w I was wondering if you could briefly summarize the point about a person has to be aware of their sin in order to understand the resurrection or whether that was vice versa, but could, could you yeah. summarize again, please? Sure. Um, in order to understand the resurrection, you need to understand why, what the purpose was for this resurrection. And that's rooted in the redemption of mankind. Well, the redemption of mankind can't be understood unless you understand the sin of mankind. It's the, because we are sinners, broke, having broken God's law, that we need redemption and that we need a resurrection from the dead because Christ satisfies the wrath of God and then rises from the dead. So in order to see and appreciate the resurrection of Christ from the dead, we need to first see our own sin and uh, be convicted of that sin to a certain measure. Now, Machen will say, you know, there are young people growing up within covenant families where, you know, every moment of life they've, you know, recognized that Christ is their Savior, they re repent of their sins and so forth on a daily basis. They don't have a kind of like a big dramatic moment when they come face to face with the glory of God and their own human sin and uh, fall before the Lord for repentance. So that, that, you know, that kind of dramatic thing is not always the case for everyone, but um, one way or the other you need to appreciate your sin. And the reason why there is a Jesus who is righteous and perfect, who performs miracles and uh, rises from the dead is because of human sin and the corruption. So, I hope that helps. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in the, in the Roman Catholic Church believing that, yeah, I have sin, and I've done innumerable things wrong, 
and it's taken care of when I go to the confession to the priest. Yeah, and, right. Uh, okay, I'm clear, and go out and start again. Yeah. <laughs> See you next Saturday, Father. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, there was still a consciousness and a, and a reinforcement of the idea of being a sinner, but the solution was wrong. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they took away, I can remember doing that as a, in Catholic school till fifth grade, and then leashed into the public schools, and here I am still somehow, not miraculously, but anyway, where I belong in the OPC. <laughs> but, but they they would uh, you would get the penance, you know, the absolution, and all this stuff, and then you'd go up and you'd say your Hail Marys and you know so, so many Hail Marys, so many Lord's prayers, and then you're fresh and good to go. But the the, the problem is we, we never. We, were, we never learned that we were dead in our sins. Mm-hmm. We never learned that we were dead. We never tru- truly understood the need for a savior. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and was never brought to light. It was the, 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 the true nature of sin. So that, that, that's a great point. Like, how can, we, how can I possibly have appreciated what Christ did or, the, or, or a true need for a savior if I didn't even understand <laughs> <laughs> if I thought I was all taken care of by the priest, yeah, you know. Well, what you're describing is where the, the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church replaces the priesthood of Christ, and you, you're being misdirected away from Christ, who you should go to for the forgiveness of sins, and you're going to the church through its priestly absolution and you know, the confessional, and then all the rest of it, the um, good works and so forth. So. You know, the, the church comes in and pushes Christ aside and says, come and look at me. <laughs> come to me and let me take care of your sin problem. Yeah, another part, where, where was it, Melchizedek? Was it that, you could probably explain this, I, I'm not, don't, but I mean, like, where, where they go ahead to, to explain that Jesus was the greatest priest, the, the greatest prophet, the greatest king, because he always was and always will be. So his, um, oh, I'm not getting it straight, Remember that. Um, uh, You're right. In the book of Hebrews, it talks about Jesus mm-hmm. as after the order of Melchizedek. Right, and right. That's he had a, a, an endless life, kind of like Melchizedek was recorded by Moses, not having a beginning of days or end of life. It just, he just appears there. And it was symbolic of Christ's immortal life. And so he ever lives to make intercession for us now, uh, far superior. Right, that, that, that's what we should have been taught. You know, instead of the priest being the, the one who's forgiving the sins or the has the, is the only one that reads the gospel or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we were taught, like, like the pastor said, you know, it, it was deflection from Christ to the church. And, and we, we, weren't, we were taught a cheap grace. Like, go to, go to the yeah. priest, confess your sins, do this penance, and you're clear. And nothing at all to do with the with the suffering of Christ on our behalf. Mm-hmm. Uh, that he took that for those who believe, he took away their sin. For those who repent, he took up to him <laughs> that their salvation. Um, it, it was just a cheap grace. All right, you told me your sins. Now go do this to make up for it. You're good, and and that was it. Yeah. That's their theology. Oh man, I, I, I don't know how these priests. What it must be like to hear all these confessions, and just uh, and and I wonder how they could be. Um, what's what's the word I'm looking for? How how they would have the confidence that they gave enough penance to make up for the people said. Did I tell this person to say enough Hail Marys? To save them, should I have told them say say three rosaries instead of two? Should I give them enough penance to make up for their sins? I'm responsible for that. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like they, they they felt they had some kind of power. Yeah. Um, even when they when they transformed the 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 host and the wine into the actual body body and blood of Christ, they I think they had. 
maybe they were convinced themselves or, you know, I remember part of their instruction was they believed they had these magic powers. <laughs> just, I mean, yeah. it's hard to say without like a little laughing a little bit, but I, I think they really felt they were some, uh-oh, here he goes, we supper and, and the popish man, popish, popish man. Wow. <laughs> No. I just finished, I just finished this book last night. I read it in two days. Of course, and it's by Cornelius Venema, who's the president of of Mid America Reform Seminary. And the whole purpose of the book is to show that the 80th question and answer in the Heidelberg Catechism needs to be maintained because churches that hold the Heidelberg Confession uh, Catechism are taking that question out thinking that it offends Roman Catholics because oh, it talks about the difference between the Protestant view of the Lord's Supper and the Roman Catholic view of the Lord's Supper. And um, and that that question <laughs> either goes all the way back to the 1500s. It proceeds, it proceeds our Westminster Confession by a hundred years. So um, anyway, I read this. I read this book last night, and it, it, it's only ninety pages, so it's real easy to read, and uh, very well presented on why why should the the Christian Reformed Church has taken question eighty, and now removed it as part of its confession, you know, because they don't want to offend Roman Catholics on on their views. Uh, they. They tell, they tell the Roman Catholics in that 80th question, first of all, that, that they're teaching that Christ is everywhere present in his physical body, which is not true, and that you can worship the elements because they become the body and blood of Christ, which is idolatry. So that's what that 80th question talks about. And it says it in a way that was what, how people talked about error and and wrong teaching in the 1500s. So I realize this almost 500 years later now. Uh, but in the way that they talk there in that 80th question or the um, Ursinus uh, was, uh, was the one who uh, probably wrote that catechism. Uh, is that Jacob or Sinus or something like that. Anyway, he um, you know, told it like it was. <laughs> and that's what the Roman Catholic Church needs to hear. They need to hear, you're wrong. You are teaching idolatry. You are, you are misrepresenting the human nature of Jesus in, this, in that sacrament. So. But sure. let's... That's just one thing of all the things we've been talking about. Yeah, they, they, they have quite a few of the, the, the worship of statues and the and, and right. Mary and all. Mary. Yeah, there's just the priesthood itself is wrong. Right. Yeah. Hebrew, the book of Hebrews points out that there's no no need for a priesthood anymore. Christ, our priest, has been slain, and he's, he's our, our priest now. And we become priests ourselves in uh, to the world, but but not in the sense of what we don't reinstate or the Old Testament priesthood is abolished. We don't want that again. That's what the Roman Catholic Church is. It's a reestablishment of the Old Testament priesthood. But the Pope is the high priest, and then all these other yep. priests. Well, they, they believe the Pope is in the line of Peter, right? Something like that, like he's the next... Yeah, Peter was the first Pope, they believe. Yeah. So we have no... Imagine a head full of no that. There's no historical Here. evidence for it. You know, we know that Peter was crucified in Rome, upside down. You know, we have some... I don't know where, where that's established historically and what writing or whatever about it. But you know, we well, don't know that... It's Peter tradition. Did. It's tradition. Yeah, Peter didn't have a an office in Rome where he went to every day. He was <laughs> he was the pope, and he was ruling from that office in Rome. Yeah. And even that even that belief is all based on a misinterpretation of Peter's confession. 
have faith right. on this rock to build my church. Uh, about it being based on Peter, not on the confession of faith. That, that's where the papacy started. Good thing Before, it wasn't based on Peter. <laughs> and a moment later, he was trying to persuade yeah, Jesus yeah. not to be crucified. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Plus, he was married too, right? Wasn't he? Wasn't he married? Yeah, he was yeah. married. Yeah. Yeah, law. Yeah, he had a wife. He's the only pope that was married. <laughs> I think he was a little more humble than the Pope, too, I have to believe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. wonder if he had a baby. So I wonder. <laughs> was he a birthing person? Was he woke? <laughs> I, I don't know if we can completely assume it, but that's <laughs> presumptuous. But to think that he was married and didn't have children, mm. I, I think that we can pretty much say he probably did have a child or, or children. Yeah, but define man. <laughs> <They're right. laughs> yeah. Oh. Oh. yeah. Bizarre. He was, he was a holy father, but he wasn't an unholy father. <laughs> <laughs> or a natural father. Yeah. <coughs> Rick, I missed out. Who was the author of the book that you were? Oh, sure. Cornelius Venema. Venema, okay. Yeah, I don't know. Is his name up there? I didn't see the name. There, there, there it is, is now. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, he wrote the commentary on the larger catechism. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's written a few books. He's written a book about Pidal Communion, and he's written a book about. Uh, eschatology, which is I have, which is a very good book. I know I know Cornelius per, personally because he came and preached, gave a uh, did a little uh, weekend conference for us when I was in Roswell. So wow. he's excellent.